everybody. We are finishing up our look at what it means to show up in people's lives today. So far, we've talked about how wherever I am, people are welcome. So people should be able to feel safe. People should be able to feel secure in who they are when they're around me and around you. We've talked about how God has called us to be part of this great commission about as we go, we get to make disciples. And we do that by connecting with people through caring for them, through loving them unconditionally, through helping as best we can, and by being ready to tell them about Jesus when the time is right for them, not for us. We've talked about last week how when you show up, you never show up alone. You are part of this really messy, beautiful thing called the church when you're a follower of Jesus. And being part of the church means that whenever you go, you have people that are cheering you on, encouraging you, supporting you, helping you, and sometimes literally showing up with you. You don't show up alone. But in the midst of all of that, it can still feel like everything rests on you, like it's all about you, like I have to make people feel welcome. I have to be about connecting. I have to be about doing things with other people. And that's not necessarily an encouraging thought because I know me. And I know that I have lots of shortcomings. I know that I have things that I do that will push people away. I know that I have limits to my energy, to my ability to connect with people, to my ability to have time with other people, to my ability to read what's going on in a situation. And so if it's all resting on me, that's not necessarily a real encouraging or, or positive thought. And there's a key piece about showing up. Really, this is the starting point about showing up that we haven't spent a lot of time with. And that's what we're going to do today. This is the piece that will help us understand what our role is in showing up and where the power of showing up really happens. And I want to look at the life of this guy named Gideon. You can find him in your Bible in Judges chapter 6 through 8. Most of his story is there. And I want to set the stage for what is happening when we meet Gideon. Israel's not in a good place. They've done evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so he's kind of left a hand of protection off of them for a little bit. And in the midst of that, these enemies, especially the people called the Midianites, have been coming in and doing whatever they want with the Israelites in their land. They're taking all of their crops all of their water, all of their animals, whatever they want, they grab. And the people of Israel are terrified because they can't do anything about it. They're intimidated, they're scattered, they don't know what's going on. And so Gideon, when we're introduced to him in chapter 6, is actually hiding in a pit. He's doing this thing called threshing the wheat. What that means is he's taking the wheat and he's, he's kind of tossing it up in the air to try and get the chaff that's worthless to go away while the grains that are going to feed him and his family stay down at the bottom. But the problem is you want to do that up someplace where there's a good airflow, someplace where the wind can come and take this stuff away. That's not really what's going on inside of a pit. But he's in there because he's terrified. He's terrified that if, if he's up where people can see him, then the Midianites are going to come and whatever little bit he's been able to gather, they're going to take. And so he's hiding. He may also be hiding because he's worried about his fellow countrymen. Like, they're not the best moral people right now. They're desperate because of what's going on. And if they see him having a little bit of food, and he's from the smallest tribe and the smallest family, and he's the least of his family, so his social standing is really, really low, they may be coming to take what he's got too. And so here he is huddled in a hole when God comes to talk to him. And when God shows up to talk to him, he, he gives him this crazy mission. You thought what well, you got was crazy. It's, it's similar, but it seems more terrifying when I look at it through what Gideon had to do. He said, hey, Gideon, I want you to go and help bring freedom and life back to your people, the Israelites. That's a bit of an overwhelming call, and it's not something that Gideon felt like he could do. And yet that's the moment that God comes to him. And I have to believe that Gideon wanted that. I have to believe that Gideon desired to see people set free. He desired for life to come, not only for his countrymen, but also for himself. He just didn't see how Gideon could do it. What did he have to offer? He's hiding in a hole. He can barely feed himself. He has no uh, army, no tactical skill. What is he supposed to do? 
In fact, he thinks God gets the wrong person. Because when God shows up and sees Gideon, he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, mighty warrior is kind of a silly thing to call Gideon, right? Here's this little guy hiding in a hole so that people won't steal his lunch. It doesn't sound like a mighty warrior to me. And so Gideon keeps talking, talking with God about this. He's, he's pushing back like, you have got the wrong person at the wrong time. This is not for me. And then as it starts to realize that God's not letting this go, he keeps asking for confirmation over and over again because he's just not confident. But each time, God keeps giving him the same response. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And then in, later in verse 14, he says, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Look, Gideon, quit worrying about what you don't have. Just go with what you do have to do this. And even though Gideon doesn't get that he has more than he thinks, God still is calling him to do it. It doesn't matter that nothing is in Gideon's hand right now. It doesn't matter that his strength is weak. He's supposed to do what God's asking him to do. And God will tell him why this will work. He says, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Go in the strength you have. Am I not sending you? I will be with you. There's this trend in everything that God is telling to Gideon. He's like, Gideon, your role, your responsibility is to show up when and where I tell you to show up. My presence is what's going to bring the power to bear. My presence is what makes the difference here. And so the time finally comes. All of the enemies of Israel are gathered in one place. Now, I don't know if that's good strategy or not, but I do know that means that all of the enemies are together and there's a lot of them. And they're camped out, getting ready to come in and take whatever they want from Israel one more time. And God says, this is the moment to Gideon. And so Gideon rallies the troops. And when he rallies the troops, there's 32,000 people that show up, which sounds like a really good army until you realize what we've been told is that's probably at best... Five to one odds. It doesn't look as good then. And God looks at this crowd and he tells Gideon, you've got too many soldiers. Anyone who's scared, anyone who's terrified of going out into battle, go home. And so they take him at his word and they take him up on his altar and 22,000 people leave. So this army that was already outnumbered at 32 thousand is now down to ten thousand they march a little bit to get towards the enemy camp and they get hot and they get tired and they get thirsty and god looks at them and says there's still too many this doesn't make sense right still too many and so he says look go take them to the river give them something to drink and anyone who scoops up the water like this and then drinks it keep them and send everybody else home so gideon watches as they go to get the drinks and at the end of their little rehydrating time, there's only 300 soldiers left. 300. From 32,000 to 300. So now it's 300 against an army. And God says, finally, we've got the numbers where they're supposed to be. And so in the middle of the night, they come and they surround the camp of the enemy. And it gets crazier. Here's their attack plan. In one hand... A trumpet to blow and the other hand a torch with a jar over it hiding their presence until just the right moment and when the signal is given they're going to smash the jar hold up the torch blow on the trumpet shout make as much noise as they can a sword for the Lord and for Gideon and all of these things are going to happen while they're surrounding the camp but don't go into the camp and so these 300 men who have more trust than I would probably have do this they smash the jar, they blow on the trumpet, the noise is loud, they're waving things around. And as they're doing this, you have to realize, if you have a torch in one hand and a trumpet in the other, there's no hand to hold a sword, right? There's no hand to grab a spear or to put up a shield or to throw an arrow into the air. But that is what they were asked to do. 
That's what they show up to do. And as the noise grows and as the torches wave, confusion and fear run through the enemy camp, so much so that they start to turn on each other and kill each other until just a few start to flee out into the darkness of the night where another message gets sent to the people that went home that says, hey, if you're ready now, why don't you go clean up this mess? And Gideon wins the battle because the power of the presence of the Lord was with him. The mighty warrior never raised his sword to win the day. You see, it wasn't about what Gideon had to bring. His responsibility was simply to show up and do what God asked him to do. All of the power, all of the effectiveness, all of the ability to do something came because God's presence was there. That's what made the difference for him, and that's what makes the difference for us. God's presence is what makes showing up powerful. Not you and not me. And that is good news. You see, God invites us to participate in this awesome mission that changes people's lives now and their destiny for eternity. And the role we play is to be obedient. The role we play is to, in our strength that we have, go and do what God's asked us to do. But make no mistake, the power that comes with us is not our own. It is from the God who brings freedom and life to people. Uh, Paul is writing to the church in Galatia to try to describe what's happening when you really get a hold of who you are in Christ. And this is what he writes. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is an amazing gift to be able to be a part of bringing freedom and life to people by caring for them, by connecting for them, by giving yourself for them. And when we feel overwhelmed by that or when we get anxious about participating in this, it's because we forget whose presence really matters. We keep trying to do this work for God and we forget the effectiveness comes because God shows up. And he invites us to show up with him. So how do we get this full presence of God? You do it the same way Gideon does. Back in chapter 6 of Judges, Gideon finally runs into this, this God who meets him in a pit. And God says, look, it's not about trying to cling to the rope and do this tug of war with the enemy to win. You will lose. You can give it all you have and you are not enough by yourself. But try this. Try having a conversation with me. We call it prayer. We call it falling on our knees, whatever you want to describe it as, God is ready to talk with you. He will find you even when you're in a pit to have a conversation with you. And you can be honest with him, just like Gideon was, about your fears and about your concerns and about what's troubling you and about how underwhelming you feel you are. And he'll still be there. You can pray something as simple as, God, I want to seek you out right now. Thank you for being present with me, but help me to see where you are in my life. God, I don't want to do this thing on my own, so I need you to guide me. I need you to empower me. I need you to tell me what to do. And then when he does, when you listen and he says, this is what you need to do next, the second thing you can do like Gideon is you can obey. You can surrender to whatever it is God has called you to do because you trust him. So when the plan is scary, like going up against an army that has held you down forever, you still show up. When things get really weird, like sending everybody home, you still show up. When it gets weirder, like going into battle without having the hand for your sword, you still show up. Because you do what God's asked you to do. Whatever that looks like. So when it looks like going and knocking on your neighbor's door and seeing how they're doing, when it looks like picking up the phone and calling the person that you really don't want to talk to, when it looks like giving up some of your plans, some of your money, some of your dreams so you can help empower somebody else to have what they need, you do it. Because you don't have to worry about what you have to offer. God will supply what you need to be who he has called you to be. 
And you have no idea what God will do with one small act of obedience. The most important part of showing up is the presence of God. Sometimes it is really good that it is not about you. I think that's what's amazing about this promise that we read from Galatians, that it's not my life, but Christ in me. Because he loves me. Because he already proved that love by giving himself for me. And so his life, his presence shows up and it brings grace to me and it transforms my heart so that when I show up and he shows up too, that grace can go out to the people I'm interacting with. Change can come to their lives. Transformation is possible. I just show up. The challenge is to do what we've been talking about the last month. We've been telling stories of people who have showed up and what that's meant for them, whether that's a, a praying for your waitress, whether that's giving a ride to someone who showed up you didn't even really want to talk to, whether that's getting involved in somebody who you feel awkward around, uh, not because it feels unsafe, but because it just doesn't feel like it clicks right. All kinds of different stories of how God will move and his power will do something if we are simply willing to show up. And so the challenge is now that we're not going to talk about it as much, don't stop showing up. Stay committed to caring for people. Pray for those people that you feel God has placed on your heart. And then be active about finding ways to serve them. Don't give up. Make it a lifestyle. Show up where you're supposed to. In fact, we talked about how this season is one that's really hard for people a lot of the time, and, and you can find different opportunities to do this. Man, take advantage of the time that you have right now. You have invitations to show up in people's lives now because of the season that we're in, to do something good for them, to give a gift, to invite them to, to something at your house or in town or even uh, to church. We're getting ready to start Advent next Sunday, which is like... It's like if you want to feel at home, this is the couple of weeks for you. If you want to feel uh, that it's time to have some hope, then these are a couple of weeks for you. And we even have something going on on Christmas Eve. Eve, man, Take advantage of those opportunities with people. Not because getting them to show up at your house or you showing up at their house or even showing up at, at God's house is the goal. The goal is for people to know that they are cared for. The goal is for people to realize there is a God who loves them and gave himself for them so that they can find the freedom and life that he gives. And you get to have a role to play. You don't bring the power, but you're invited to show up. Trust in Jesus' presence. Do what he asks you to do, and then sit back and watch as he does things that you can never ask for or imagine. Keep showing up. So in a second, I want to pray for us to keep doing that. To be actively showing up, being involved in people's lives, being about what God has called us to be about. But I also realize that for some of us, that only happens because Jesus' presence is within us and we have accepted him into our lives. And so I don't want you to, to keep going without having the chance to experience that. There is nothing that needs to keep you from experiencing that right now. God has done everything available to make that happen. Before you were born, God loved you. And he loved you so much that he knew that there was this thing called sin that was in the way of you and God having this intimate, close relationship. And so Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He died a death he did not deserve so that we could be with God. And then he rose to new life to show us what is possible when we get connected to the source of life. And he offers us forgiveness of sins. He invites us to join his family and have a place to belong. And he gives us a new life that we can grow into that, that doesn't just wait for us one day when we die and go to heaven, but starts right now. 
And if you are interested in that kind of life, God is ready to find you, even if you're sitting in a pit right now, to offer it to you. Let's pray. Lord, I'm so grateful that you love us, that you gave yourself for us, and that you come after us. God, I pray for any who's listening to my voice right now that, that wants to experience that for the first time. That you would come so close to them that they cannot deny that you're there. And even when you call them by names like beloved or valuable or masterpiece, and they don't think you're saying the right thing, God, keep confirming to them that you are who you say you are and that they are who you say you are, they are. Lord, I pray that they would reach out to you and ask for forgiveness, that they would cling to you for life, that they would find belonging in you that they have found nowhere else, and that you would do what only you can do, which is not just offer forgiveness, but transform hearts and change lives, that they might find new real life connected to you. And Lord, I pray that you would help them to find people that will grow that life, cultivate that life in them, that it would be us here in our church or, or family members or another church or whoever you have in their life, God, but they knew, would know that they don't have to do this alone. And for all of us, Father, who already know who you are, may your life in us be what drives us forward. Help us to be committed to showing up for people, people that you love, people that you gave your life for, people that you call for us to care for. They're in our homes, they're in our neighborhoods, they're at our workplaces, they're waiting for us when we go shopping or pump gas. Help us to listen to you so closely that we don't miss opportunities to let your presence give grace and transform people in the midst of what we're doing. Lord, as we go, help us to connect people to you. As we go, help us to not worry about our own agendas as much as being obedient to what it is you would ask us to do. Lord, we will find so much more fulfillment and life, so much more joy and peace if we can do that, then if we can do anything else in this world, and we have no idea what one small act of obedience will unleash through your power. We trust that there are lives waiting to be transformed if we would simply do what you've asked us to do and show up. We pray these things in your name, Father.